Okay, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, everyone, if you're in an afternoon zone or a morning zone. Hello, and welcome to the UBC and UQ Global Impact Series. And this is the first address in the series. Um, it's exciting that the first address is the Indigenous Health Inequalities webinar. Uh, my name's Bronwyn Fredericks, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous Engagement at the University of Queensland, and I'm also the moderator for today. So I'm not a speaker for today, I'm a moderator for today. I'll be introducing the speakers um, and asking the questions as we go through the webinar. Before we begin the webinar, I do want to um, acknowledge the lands that we are on in re respect of the lands that you're on, whether you're a speaker, whether you're the audience or the universities in which um, are involved in the partnership. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianships of the lands where both UQ and also UBC stand and where we're all located today. Elders past and present who continue cultural and spiritual connection to land, to country. And we recognize the important role that indigenous peoples continue to play in, our, in all of our communities and indeed to the global society um, and to, to our lives. I want to make an acknowledgement here to the UBC and UQ colleagues that may be online um, and to the students, alumni, and to the panelists, and the many attendees that are joining the address today. Welcome. I hope you're going to really enjoy the session. It's a great lineup of speakers, and the questions we've got for you are terrific, um, and um, we look forward to the responses. Just a quick note to everybody the, this will be recorded, um, and if we don't get time to answer the questions through the, the session, there'll be some time to follow up at a later date. Before we get into the panel, I'd like to introduce uh, Associate Professor Cheryl Lightfoot, who is the Senior Advisor to the President of Indigenous Affairs at the University of British Columbia to give the welcome address to everybody. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. And uh, good morning to you in Australia and good afternoon to those of us in British Columbia. I wanna thank you for having me today for the Global Impact Series. And I'm absolutely delighted to provide a warm welcome on behalf of UBC to all of us today. Uh, and we are here to discuss a very important topic uh, and, and very close to our hearts and minds here, especially in British Columbia recently, uh, global indigenous health inequality. And thank you for the, the land acknowledgement, Bronwyn. And I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from, from my home this afternoon on the UBC campus, which is the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Musqueam people. And I am Anishinaabe from the Lake Superior region. And so I'm a very long way from home. And I always like to uh, take a moment to express my gratitude to the Musqueam people for their longstanding support of Indigenous students and programming at UBC, and especially for their friendship. Uh, it, it's very meaningful to all of us. And speaking of uh, good relations and, and friendships, I also want to acknowledge that the University of Queensland and UBC share quite a strong history of productive collaboration. And I noticed the list is long. It includes joint research, academic linkages, and mobility of staff and students in, in both directions. And we at UBC are just incredibly grateful for these various partnerships. And just to take a quick look and highlight at, at a few of them, uh, UBC and UQ have a bilateral general agreement for cooperation and an academic exchange agreement that have been in place since 1995. So quite a bit of time now. And there are strong research connections between the two universities. Uh, since 2015, there have uh, been, I'm told, over 560 co-publications that involve scholars associated with both institutions across areas uh, of ecology, public health, genetics, and medicine. And recent collaborations show uh, 19 different collaborative projects attracting approximately $14 million in funding. 
And part of my work here at UBC is implementing UBC's 2020 Indigenous Strategic Plan. And this plan is intended to provide guidance at all levels of the university on Indigenous engagement. And it does so through eight different larger goals and 43 action steps that each work to advance the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in practice in concrete ways across the institution. And it's our vision to weave Indigenous human rights throughout the very fabric of our institution. In discussion of this topic, I have to note uh, the province of British Columbia's recent In Plain Sight report, which I'm sure will be discussed. Uh, this report has found a, a widespread, um, disturbingly high uh, level of systemic racism against Indigenous peoples across the British Columbia healthcare sector. Uh, to put this into perspective, 84% of the Indigenous peoples who weighed in to the survey described personal experiences of racism and discrimination that actually discouraged them from seeking necessary care and reduce their access to care. And this is alarming. And out of this report came 24 very important recommendations that we are all consider considering very carefully in this province for change. And I am sure that we will have a tremendous discussion today on the realities and the intricacies of this topic from our panel of experts. I will now turn back to welcome our moderator, Professor Bronwyn Fredericks, who will introduce our distinguished speakers and begin our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. That was great to hear that overview of what's happening there. So just to begin to um, introduce our speakers today. The first speaker will be Professor James Ward, who's a Pitjantjatjara Narunga man. James is well recognised as a national leader in Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander research. And I'll say that um, one of the other things that James has been engaged in is one of the national leads for the COVID response in regards to Australia. Um, he's currently the director of the Post Centre for Indigenous Health based at University of Queensland and professor within the School of Public Health. It's got noted here, but I notice you also have, your appointment is with the Health and Biomedical Sciences, James too. Dr. Nadine Caron is co-director at the Centre for Excellence in Indigenous Health and Associate Professor, Department of Surgery at the University of British Columbia. So welcome, Nadine. It will be exciting to hear from you. Um, Dr. Karina Walters is an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and is the Associate Dean for Research, Catherine Hall Chambers Scholar and Co-Director and Principal Investigator of the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute at the University of Washington. And Associate Professor Chelsea Bond is a Mananjali and South Sea Islander woman and Associate Professor within the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies Unit, University of Queensland and many other things in terms of research and a leading advocate for um, human rights and rights within Australia. So welcome to all the, the panellists this morning. It's great to have you all here and people better get ready because you're in for a great um, discussion between the panellists this morning. So James, I'm going to start off with you and I hope you don't mind if I just call you James rather than Professor James Wood, but James. Um, it's Close the Gap Day tomorrow in Australia. And my question first up for you is going to centre around the Close the Gap campaign um, in Australia, which aims to close the gap in terms of health and life expectancy between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and non-Indigenous Australians within one generation. The campaign is built on uh, evidence that shows that significant improvements in the health status can be achieved by 2030, and that date sometimes fluctuates depending on what we read. In February 2018, the Australian Human Rights Commission released the Close the Gap, uh, the 10-year review. So that wasn't that long ago when we've had reviews that have come up in documents since then. And the review examines why Australian government has not been successful in closing the health gap and why they will not succeed by 2030 um, if the current discourse continues. I want you to elaborate on that as to perhaps why and what's what are some of the problems with Australia's approach and what could be done better? 
Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Bronwyn. Uh, yes, as you say, uh, tomorrow marks 13 years since Australia embarked on this ambitious strategy to close the health gap between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country and non-Aboriginal people. And during that time, there's been lots of effort put into closing the gap, but unfortunately, little movement or traction in improving health outcomes. We've had small uh, improvements uh, along the way. We've closed somewhat uh, the gaps in infant and child mortality, but the gap is really wide still. Um, we've reduced smoking rates, but not to a rate sufficient enough. We've improved the number of health services and the number of preventative health checks uh, conducted in our population. Uh, and, but unfortunately, we're still lagging uh, when it comes to uh, child and infant mortality, adolescent health, uh, issues that are really pertinent to health, out of home care uh, rates for children, um, incarceration, uh, measures like obesity and psycholo psychological distress. So we've got a very long way to go. And while we've got a great set of aspirational targets on paper, we've got some commitment in terms of dollars and a lot of money has been rolled out for closing the gap. Uh, we've still got, uh, got a long way to go. And so you're right, the review in 2018 by the Human Rights Commission um, stated unless we address some fundamental uh, issues uh, around the edges of health, such as social determinants of health, housing, employment, income, uh, um, education, unless we start to close all of those gaps, we're not going to bridge uh, the health gap. Um, community involvement and decision making was also a feature of why we're not on target to meet the 2030 targets. Uh, so they suggested that we needed a fundamental shift in the way we do business, in the way we do business with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, and uh, so in 2019, um, led by the Coalition of Peaks of Aboriginal organisations in Australia, um, they embarked on an ambitious plan to put Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at the table around decision making in the, in the refresh of the Close the Gap, which is, uh, was signed off during the middle of the pandemic last year, which is phenomenal that it was signed off. And that uh, rethink of Close the Gap is a fundamental rethink. Um, there are some principles that weren't included in the first one uh, that uh, in the first 10 years have closed the gap. Um, things like very basic uh, fundamental uh, things like partnerships and shared decision making are now included. The recognition that the capabilities and capacity of the Aboriginal community controlled sector needs to be strengthened. Um, the most challenging part is the transformation of mainstream healthcare delivery and health services, I think is really um, a, a, a challenge for lots of the jurisdictions around Australia about transforming their, the way they deliver healthcare to our people. As Cheryl mentioned uh, just a moment ago, racism is a feature of, uh, of healthcare uh, for our people in Australia. And the other thing that really um, is a fundamental shift is shared access to data and information at a regional level in the new Close the Gap. So fundamentally, we have the same targets for closing the health gaps, but um, I think our people will be at the table now to, to kind of set uh, the targets and the interventions. Um, what's happened, um, I think, is that we've set some aspirational targets that are trying to address the previous four decades of failed policy in Australia and many decades of neglect prior to that. And so we're trying to do all this in a very short time, period of time, which is what we all want, but we've got uh, a very big job ahead of us. Um, the other thing that's happening is that the health status of uh, non-Indigenous Australians is improving at a faster rate than our people. And so the gap is widening even further um, and so there's a, a really a, a fundamental shift in the way we have to do business. And perhaps I suggest um, the potency of the interventions, the duration of the interventions needs to be really thought about properly um, so that we're getting uh, the potency of interventions to try and close the gap at the same rate that, they're clo that uh, health is improving in the non-Aboriginal population. The strengths I think of our uh, close the gap uh, agenda is that we have an aspirational set of targets. Um, I think we've got much greater involvement now at the community level uh, for 
input into the decision making around close the gap. Um, we have a whole of healthcare agenda now, not just to focus on Aboriginal community controlled health services in achieving uh, transformation and good quality care. Uh, often the focus is on only the Aboriginal medical services and not mainstream. So I think that's a strength of the new uh, gap. And some of our weaknesses, I think, uh, how do we address all of these social determinants? That will require government to really think differently about housing, for instance. It's the major issue in many of our communities, whether you're in an urban environment or a, in a remote community. Um, the reality is, is, I think, the potency of our interventions, we can't go along doing the same as what we think is working in the non-Aboriginal population. I think we need to think very carefully about the potency of our um, of our interventions. And I'll let Chelsea talk to this, but really the, the slow burn issue, and it's a massive issue, is racism in our healthcare system. And uh, I think if we don't address that at the societal level, it's not gonna be working in the healthcare system. So. Mute, yeah, thanks, James. That was great and good to get that context at multiple levels across, you know, different sectors as well that provide answers and people can, people can hear that in terms of the differences across the sectors. I'm going to turn to Nadine now, Nadine Karun, um, because you bring an interesting perspective now. We wrote focus on Canada, but in terms of the closing the gap as not just a panellist today, but co-director for the Centre of Excellence in Indigenous Health at UBC, and a surgeon in Canada as well. And on International Women's Day, I'm going to draw on this, um, you delivered a keynote via Zoom on uh, perspectives of First Nation as a First Nations physician in Canada. And you spoke about closing the gap and close the gap disparities um, and that that's not being enough. And I wanted you to come into this now and build on what James has said because you spoke about close the gap. I think it would be a nice intersect there. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Bronwyn, and thanks, James, and to the organizing committee. This is an exciting uh, group of colleagues to be with, and I'm honored. Um, so first of all, the Closing the Gap campaign in Australia, I've heard about it across the pond, and it, it sounds amazing, and I have heard that there's been success. Um, and so thanks, James, for obviously being one of the leaders in that area. Um, when I was given, given that talk on International Women's Day, I was asked to be provocative. And for colleagues of mine, they know, oh my goodness, be careful when you ask Nadine to be provocative. And so what I looked at is closing the gap. And, and that, that, first of all, there's tons of gaps, but also for generations, that's been a goal. And generations and generations, the gaps are extensive, they're overbearing, uh, and this is a monumental task. And we all recognize that. Um, but sometimes it, I can't help, you know, whether it's in my role as a surgeon and caring for First Nations people in Northern rural British Columbia, or whether it's as the co-director for the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health at UBC and the multiple programs we run, um, whether it's the First Nations Health Authority Chair in Cancer and Wellness, where I'm more of a researcher uh, and seeing it that in that way, I just, I can't help but realize that we do have to reestablish that. And I'm thrilled to hear some of the work that's been going on in terms of reestablishing uh, sort of who's at the table and, and what those goals really mean, James. So first of all, and when I think about the gaps, uh, the first thing I always wanna sort of extend is what gaps are we talking about? Um, and in Canada, there it, it's actually quite scary, uh, different passport, uh, different seasons right now, different hemispheres, but a lot of the same statistics. So when it comes to just health status overall, whether it's public health statistics like infant mortality or life expectancy, the gaps are there. Whether it's disease specific, cancer, diabetes, mental health issues, heart, hypertension, coronary artery disease, whatever it is, the gaps are there. Um, whether it's access to healthcare services, and we have similar demographics, similar geographies. We have massively rural areas and extensive geography and populations that are sort of around certain parts of the country, the coast in Australia and the south in Canada. And it leaves this, the, the distribution of Indigenous peoples in Canada massively challenged with access because of where they are and where they live and the challenges there. Um, but at the same time, it's the disparities in utilization. And I think we're gonna get into that a little bit more. It sounds like Chelsea's gonna be talking about that, but overall, like if you don't feel that it's safe 
if you don't trust what's going to happen to you or your loved one, then it doesn't matter if the screening mammogram machine is across the street, or it doesn't matter if the surgeon is down the road. It doesn't matter if the hospital is within sight. Uh, that's not really there. It's not accessible to the point that you would utilize it. And nothing counts on that. It actually is used and is used in a safe way, in a good way, and, and people feel uh, safe and respected. So there's the access and utilization disparities. There's the social determinants of health that every politician panics about when you bring in because they can't afford to put that in the Ministry of Health budget. And so that's looking at the classic social determinants, housing, safe water, um, education, but it's also looking at Indigenous specific determinants of health that we don't even have to talk about disparities because only Indigenous people are dealing with the legacy of Indian residential schools, the colonization, um, the impact of the, the, the Indian hospitals, the, you know, all of these sort of things. And we see those already, those determinants of health impacting things like COVID and other public health emergencies like the opioid crisis in BC. And so we're, we're seeing those disparities. But then there's areas where even as a researcher, uh, what about research? If we put so much money and so much time and so much accolades into research, then what about the funds available for Indigenous research? What about who sets the topics for what the calls for proposals are going to be? Uh, what about who is doing the research in the realm of Indigenous researchers? What about people in leadership positions that are driving this? Are they Indigenous? And how many are Indigenous? And including down at the university level. And so there's all these determinants or all these gaps, all these disparities. And so this is a monumental task. But I asked three questions on International Women's Day. I asked one, is that an adequate goal? Because if you set a goal and you achieve it, then theoretically you should be really proud. Generally speaking, I mean, my daughter knows that she's a teenager. She knew that when she was five. Um, and so I think in Australia, you are decreasing the gaps. In Canada, we are decreasing the gaps. The only thing is, is that there's still gaps. And so at what point is it enough? Or do we want to say decreasing the gaps? Is that just an inadequate goal? And so then I said, well, what if we were aiming for equality? Like, what if we were saying every, like, get rid of the gaps completely? Harder, definitely, would take longer, you know, harder timelines, but get rid of them altogether. Sounds good. The only problem is exactly what you just said, James, is that if, if you want, uh, you know, let's say survival from a certain cancer, as a cancer surgeon, I often go to that. If survival from a certain cancer is here for non-Indigenous people and here for Indigenous people in Canada, and we aim to get to here, guess what? Everybody in Canada wants to survive cancer. They want to live longer. They want to, so by the time we get up to here, they're up to there. And the disparities, I agree, in many ways are probably getting worse because of the moving goalposts phenomenon. And then finally, the one that really threw people for a loop is, is it just an odd goal? And I think indigenous peoples here on the panel, but certainly in the audience will get this. In the end, is it just weird that if we have our politicians, our ministries of health, our healthcare professionals, our health profession in general, if they just say, we, we will include even the moving goalposts and we will get you to where we are at, at what point does one population have the right to set the limits of another just because it's the best that they can do? And I think really, I think that we just move up, we set our goals, we set our where we wanna be based on what our people tell us, what our, our elders tell us, what we know we can do. And then if we happen to be leading the way, we'll help the rest of Canada or the rest of Australia catch up. Chimigwitch. Well, thank you, Nadine. It's really powerful and gave us a lot to think about there in terms of how those goalposts change because, you know, we hear, and I know certainly from my perspective, we hear people say we don't seem to get anywhere and we sometimes can get despondent and we hear people in communities talk in despondent, you know, become sad um, because people are working really, really hard. And I know um, Chelsea and James know that here where they, they work with the community. People work really hard and um, but it's that same language. I'm going to turn to Karina before I come back to Chelsea uh, and come to Chelsea. But Karina, um, in terms of the gap across the jurisdictions you work, because you work with multiple peoples in terms of Indigenous people, um, peoples, I want to hear some of the, the talk there and then we'll come back to 
Chelsea to look at some of the talk where it intersects them with the racism and the work she's doing around the, the health humanities and race. So Karina, if you can just talk a, a, about that in respect to your, your work. Uh, well, thank you, Bruno. And Holly, tell us how to for the how to push it and transport Chebichi Ahoyo with the Chata Siahoke, with Yokoke, Okla, the Wamish, and Snohomish. Um, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Karina Walters. I'm greeting you uh, from the lands of the Duwamish and Snohomish people here in Seattle, Washington. And uh, it's an honor and privilege and I acknowledge and recognize all of the ancestors and lands and territories that you all are sitting in too. And I have to say, I have both James and Nadine, it, it's so easy to follow you in many ways because you've said it all. <laughs> you've hit on the key areas that, and unfortunately we share, as you pointed out, Nadine, we share way too much uh, with respect to close the health gap. And I just wanted to point out uh, Nadine's point about the health gap, you know, is that even the question that we should be even looking at and, and identifying? And uh, uh, Dr. Kiave Koholokula, a native uh, Hawaiian, a scholar once said, why have we set the standard as our comparison to white people? They are sick too, and they are actually from a very sick, sick society. So why that should not be our measuring set, uh, our standard by which we close the gap. And so um, I actually am a proponent of saying that we need to set our own vision and our own uh, understanding of what our well being needs to be and envision that indigenous futures, that indigenous health sovereignty for us as indigenous people. And, um, uh, but that what's really hard though in, in the forms that we exist in, in health services and health research and, and health workforce development, um, and, and addressing this idea of this gap. Um, is that quite often, at least in the United States, indigenous populations, we're actually erased quite often from the data itself. Uh, we're very small in population and we have to deal with statistics, literally what we, some people call statistical genocide or uh, data genocide. Uh, and we're quite often in the position of having to focus on accessing uh, and, and generating data to be able to um, be able to say, how can we measure a way to close the health gap? Uh, and when we do have data, it's quite often in the mortality data. And that's where you see us leading most of the uh, criteria. We, we lead the, the numbers there, uh, whether it's infant mortality, um, uh, so cancer survival rates and uh, HIV AIDS survival rates or uh, any of these other indicators, we unfortunately quite often are leading. COVID-19 right now is certainly exploiting that uh, for us. Uh, we are three times more likely to die uh, from COVID-19 yet. Uh, most state health departments are not adequately tracking data or we are misclassified as race other than uh, native. Now, why is that? And this is the part that I think is really critical to uh, addressing from at least from the research point of view um, is that, you know, we can't understand the health gap and we can't understand health equity without thinking about and understanding the role of settler colonialism in relation to our health. And, and this is the structure in which the, uh, uh, the ongoing structures of determinants of health and social determinants of health exists. It exists within certain kinds of philosophies and uh, epistemologies and ways of knowing that are not supportive of indigenous thought and life ways. And in fact, there's a drive through these structures to erase indigeneity. And also then that's connected to land dispossession. So, that's the reality in which we're gathering health data and trying to understand how to close the health gap. Um, and then we look at events like historically traumatic events uh, that uh, Nadine uh, identified as well and other factors that quite often aren't even measured, much less uh, understood how it's transmitted or carried through in our communities. Um, and then you couple that with the ongoing structural racism and issues of you know, inadequate housing, inadequate access to healthcare, um, and poverty, and all of these issues, uh, then we've, we've got basically a recipe for horrible health inequity uh, in, our, in our communities. So how do we deal with that? One is the visibility issue needs to be addressed, right? We have to create data and access data. We have, that means we have to create a native health researcher workforce who are 
asking the questions that are most credible and meaningful to our communities to understand what is health, what is well-being, what are we striving for? We actually have to look at upstream uh, preventive interventions, not just plugging the, the hole or closing the gap. Whenever I hear closing the gap, I think of a, a canoe that has a hole and, it, and we're, it's filling with water. And uh, we're basically given a, a small little cup to, to deal with that. <laughs> we're not given the tools or the wherewithal to actually plug the hole and, and heal it and help the structure be whole again. Instead, we're given a cup and we're constantly bailing water out and, and so we never get anywhere. That's why that goalpost always feels like it's moving. Um, and so for us, it means we need to flip the script, we need to flip the canoe and we need to plug that hole. And how do we begin to do that? And so for me, that's uh, about returning uh, more to our indigenous ways of knowing and being and really growing uh, culturally derived solutions um, that, that our ancestors have carried and that we still have the opportunity to develop. It's about creating sustainable health interventions that are not tied to only services. Um, we've become a service-oriented culture through capitalism and the marketplace and other kinds of things, and even our own tribal communities. Um, this is part of our decolonization, I think, but even our own tribal communities um, have situated so many of our cultural activities now within services that we, we fail, which is important. Services are, a, they're the stopgap, they actually help in crisis, but for sustainable long-term change, we're talking about making um, uh, something that has to be at the community level, that has to be in the places where people play, work, recreate, um, and connect. And that's the land. You know, and it, to me that ties directly to decolonization and addressing settler colonialism. So we've seen in our, a lot of our communities a real growth and movement towards land-based healing as a way to address health inequities. Um, whether it's directly working with the land to produce food, so we don't have these food des deserts anymore. Since when, why should we accept food deserts? Why should we even accept that as a concept? If we have land, if we have trees, if we have water, if we have all of these opportunities, there's no reason we should be starving, right? So, you know, when did we accept this container of how we're to understand our, our struggles. Um, you know, the way I think about it is uh, uh, the Hawaiian elder said once, and that this stuck with me and helped me change and get out of a, only a historical trauma paradigm. You know, he said, uh, he's the example of crabs in the bucket. If crabs, you know, try to crawl out, you know, the crabs pull a crab down. And we talk about that as lateral violence or an example of, of internalized oppression. And if I was a social worker in that bucket, I'd be, oh, come on crabs, we can all lift up together. We can work it out, we can get out. Um, but he asked the most important question and this is what we have to do with our indigenous thinking, right? Is ask the right questions. And he asked the uh, right question. He said, do crabs live in a bucket? Like, no, crabs don't live in a bucket. And so he said, so why did we accept the bucket as defining crab behavior? What do crabs do in the natural world, in their healthy environments? They actually lift each other up on rocks. They help each other. And I'm sure there's one or two bad crabs out there that will knock each other off. But generally crab behavior, when the environment is healthy, is healthful. And that's when I started thinking, ah, oh, how have we as researchers and how have we as clinicians and how have we as health practitioners accepted the bucket? There's a Western bucket that always gets us framed into understanding our health equity, whether it's close the gap or you know, however we, we frame it, that, that creates a bucket for understanding healthful behavior. And we, then we're required to work within that bucket. And so that made me realize we need to blow away that bucket and really work on creating the environments that produce indigenous health. And to me, that's, that's the wave of the future. And that's what our communities, I'm seeing that happen in our communities now. And, um, and I think that that's really exciting. I'm gonna stop there because I'm taking too much time, but um, that, that's just what James and, and Nadine got me started yeah. on. <laughs> I think um, you, 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 you complimented that really well, Karina, because as you were saying about the, the bucket and defining it, you know, I was thinking about what Nadine said too around, you know, who asked the questions and who's in the universities and who frames the research and the funding. And actually that shapes the bucket for all of us. 
and the same in terms of James was saying about the policies and things that actually drives the service provision and the actual domains of the bucket. So we're caught in that. Um, and Chelsea writes about some of that in terms of that segue between the racism and public health. And Chelsea also wanted to note too that you did a really great uh, piece of work last year, which looked at racism and health in Canada and Australia through the Luigi Institute. And Chelsea is framing some of this work around the um, drive for health humanities and the recognition of that in Australia. If you can talk, um, Chelsea, then about how the systemic racism isn't going to, by not, not dealing with that is not going to address elements of closing the gap um, and what that then means for us going forward. Yes. Um, thank you, Bromron. Um, and thank you to Nadine, James and Karina. It's, it's really nice to just be in conversation with you this morning or this afternoon. Um, as a Manjali woman, I'm a visitor in the country that I'm speaking from today. So I'm speaking from Yagara country, um, the land in which I was born and raised in and have the good fortune to live on. Um, it's interesting, this conversation around systemic racism and closing the gap as though they're like two separate things and how do we um, close the gap via systemic racism. And I can't really disentangle the two and I'm probably going to um, echo much of what's being said. Um, but one of my, uh, I guess, bugbears in thinking about racism is the kind of not having any conceptual clarity about what we're talking about when we say racism. Because lots of people have feelings about racism. Um, so I just want to preface this by I, I refer to Turan Hamilton's definition of institutional racism when I'm talking about racism. Um, and of course, in Black Power, they spoke of both individual and institutional racism. We know racism or the individual kind, that's one that's captured on smartphones and televisions, it can get recorded. Um, it's observed in the process of commission, they argue. Um, the second, less overt, more subtle, but no less destructive, in fact, quite violent, is institutional racism. Um, and it originates in the operation of established and respective forces in society and receives far less public condemnation. Um, so for me as a critical race scholar, I'm in this awkward position of um, condemning something that we're supposed to be saying is really good. Um, and the question I have is not just how does systemic racism close the gap, but how racist is closing the gap as a policy agenda at every level. So I want to quickly just count the ways, and again, I, I'm building up, I think, Nadine and Karina, um, much of what you've had to say. Um, at its foundation, I know of not one Indigenous nation that ever asked for closing the gap as a policy approach. We didn't ask for it, so why should we be grateful for it? Um, I know of not one nation on this continent that operates on an understanding of health as articulated by that framework. Um, again, yeah, we're not in a bucket, um, so why are we working within it? Um, this idea that our, we'll advance our health by becoming more proficient in the master's tools is not saved us yet, um, despite more of us becoming doctors and epidemiologists and all those things. Um, the ideological premise of closing the gap is itself racist. The fact that, you know, who is the norm, who occupies this, the status of good health of which we must aspire to. Um, if I wanted to get a sense of health and what it is to be human in its fullest sense, I would not turn to colonising societies as the exemplar of that. Um, there is something deeply unhealthy, deeply violent and toxic about settler societies. And right now in real time, we have grieving black families outside coroner's courts in this moment that are testifying to that. Only last week, we had the coronal inquiry of Mr. Nathan Reynolds who died of an asthma attack in prison. Now the coroner noted that there were deficiencies in the care provided to him, that it was a preventable and avoidable death. Yet the finding of the coroner's courts was natural causes destined to die. Despite over a decade of failure of closing the gap, rather than abandon it, we've seen a refreshing of the commitment to these obscure statistical targets. And what was interesting, they came up with more targets that were actually less ambitious because they knew they couldn't achieve them. Um, what's concerning is the fact that we've signed up to them, or at least our peaks have signed up to them, not our nations. The concern about um, this policy failure is that it's the system working as it was designed the Australian public health system was not meant for us. And in fact, it alibied a settler colonial state that deemed us destined to die, that we weren't here. Um, and sadly, we're still committed to that. Um, operationally, with closing the gap, we see, we're seeing black bodies that are getting surveilled from birth to death, as though our ill health is a product of black lack. Like literally, we have to subject ourselves to annual health checks. My children cannot participate in a football carnival within our community unless I subject their bodies to being surveilled by the health system. And the health system right now is rewarding itself financially for surveilling black bodies. 
We also know there's no evidence base for uh, routine health checks in populations and reducing health disparities. So why is the system financing itself to surveil black bodies knowing it doesn't improve health outcomes? We simply cannot talk about Indigenous health improvement. We cannot talk about survival of the tribe if we don't get real on how race works in this place every day, everywhere, but especially in the institutions that employ us and the disciplines that we've been trained in. Um, I'm here as a Mullinjali woman not to be of service to either of them. And it's why I often sit at the margins of my discipline and at the margins of the centres that employ me. Um, but my, my, my goal here is not to close the gap, but to be of service to my people and the task of survival on our terms. So I'm with Karina, let's abandon the bucket. Thank you. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, I'm going to move from what you've all said there, and we've had this segue into the closing the gap, um, this intersections across there, we talked about racism. I'm going to look at how it plays out now in regards to the current pandemic. And I know that is something that we're dealing with regardless of jurisdiction at the moment in terms of how that how that's moving across communities. And Karina touched on it. I mentioned that James is working in that area in Australia. And I'm going to go back to you, James, because it's actually driven a lot of your work in the past 12 months. And some of that work has also impacted internationally as well in terms of that national committee in Australia. But what can we learn from the pandemic and, and what can more importantly too that the Australian health services learn from the ways Indigenous people have managed the pandemic um, in regards to going forward You're on mute, James. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Bronwyn, yep. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, extraordinary efforts have gone into protecting uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over the last year against the current pandemic, against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, fortunately, uh, we have a very good success story, which uh, ironically hasn't been heralded um, as much as it could have been um, over the last year. So we, uh, in total, have had only 150 cases of COVID uh, notified among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And uh, that equates to a rate around six times less uh, than the non-Indigenous population in Australia. I know uh, much has been said about the comparison, but actually, and much has been said about public health system and the systems we've had to work in. That's what we had to work in, and that's what we, uh, uh, have worked in, and but I guess the strength that uh, has been brought to the public health table is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So very early in the pandemic, uh, we alerted government that actually there, there needs to be a separate uh, response for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We convened an Aboriginal task force very early uh, in early March uh, last year. And that committee has really driven the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander response across Australia. That committee comprises about 40, 40 Aboriginal people from communities from the far flung northwest of Australia, right through to Melbourne and Sydney, um, all, up, all over Queensland. Um, professionals who know their communities, who work in their communities every day, and really um, who knew the issues. And so I sit on the, the non-Indigenous committee that the Communicable Disease Network of Australia, and actually where the work got done for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people was in the task force. And we, it was the interface between those two committees. Thankfully, the system was agile enough to uh, respond very quickly. That never happened in previous pandemics, so the H1N1 of 2009. Uh, and we acted very quickly we mobilised very quickly uh, and what was essential in the response, I think, is culture. Um, our responses were culture centred. Uh, we had prevention messages rolled out very quickly. Um, I'll never forget waking up on a Sunday morning in April last year and the Northern Land Council, not a health organisation, had translated COVID prevention messages into 19 different languages in the far north of uh, the Northern Territory overnight without any kind of request. And I'll never forget that. And um, uh, our communities responded uh, early in the days and they still are demanding uh, responses that they want. Um, uh, uh, 
to communities, particularly called for early action to close off their communities. They didn't want outside visitors into their communities. That prompted uh, the Australian government to uh, implement biosecurity measures to protect Aboriginal communities, but without the leadership of Aboriginal communities, that would not have occurred. And that happened very quickly. Um, uh, so I think that's been great. Um, we've managed to move mountains um, in what would have taken decades to address uh, some of the issues. Our data quality for COVID is absolutely phenomenal. We managed to roll out testing uh, machines, point of care testing machines to uh, 45 communities and in total 85 communities uh, in a very short space of time um, to reduce uh, delays for COVID. Uh, we um, established uh, Indigenous specific uh, respiratory clinics in communities where there was no testing available. Uh, and so it's been a very good news story, but it wouldn't have been that if we didn't have an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander task force. So. Yep, thanks. thanks, James. Thank you, um, James. Um, real uh, def definite strengths-based approaches there coming from community and the response to do those languages straight away. And we've seen that even since then gain momentum and translating um, other documents now into languages as well, which has been in terms of policies for community. I'm not from government, but driven by community. Nadine, I'm going to turn to you because you had um, in, in Canada the um, what's called the In Plain Sight Report, and that came out last year during that time as well of the pandemic. But what, what changes do you think that may take on or bring in in terms of addressing health or being able to connect in the same ways that James talked about community-driven work? Right, right. Well, the In Plain Sight uh, was uh, commissioned, um, an inquiry uh, commissioned by the provincial government after a culturally, uh, cultural safety and humility course platform called Sanyas um, actually identified racist comments and uh, racist issues within the healthcare system by some of its participants. And essentially it emerged from, for those that are from the other end of the pond over in Australia, it emerged from uh, some stories where uh, there was experiences that healthcare providers in emergency rooms, uh, in a few emergency rooms in British Columbia were identified as actually playing a game similar to the Price is Right, where someone would come into the emergency room and you, there would be sort of a pool and people would guess the blood alcohol level of the patient. Um, and then the closest without going over the classic Paris is right rule um, would then quote win. Um, and of course, the, there, the stories that came in through this platform was that it was uh, fairly indigenous, but not exclusively, but fairly in, uh, specific to indigenous uh, participants. And so that obviously was not uh, something that they could uh, escape very easily. And I think the provincial government did a good job. And actually, Mary Ellen Turkel-Lafont, actually uh, with the Faculty of Law at UBC, was then brought on to lead that inquiry. And I think her and her team did an amazing job. Uh, I'm sure they saw uh, many a tears uh, and uh, some egregious stories and what was shared by Indigenous uh, populations in BC, whether it was First Nations, Métis, or yeah. perhaps even Inuit, um, and got these stories from healthcare providers, from physician, uh, physicians, from patients, from patient families, from people who weren't patients because they didn't trust going into the healthcare system and why they didn't go into these healthcare systems and some of the statistics that, uh, that Cheryl talked about. Ultimately, I think this, this is spurred on by, we of course have UNDRIP and our, our you know, similar parallels between Australia and Canada in terms of how our federal governments actually came upon UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. We have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada and the calls to action, which were involved cultural safety and humility. And then we have this report in BC. I think it remains to be seen. It's relatively new in its release. I think it remains to be seen whether this and its recommendations, of which there are 24, um, that are quite specific, you know, whether this is one of those beautiful reports that then ends up on the shelf all too soon, maybe padded with excuses about COVID and all the challenges at the time, um, or whether we can keep the momentum going because it, there are some egregious findings in that. Uh, the nice thing about it, I think, um, from our perspective is similar to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, 
where there were the calls to action, that was really a tool in your back pocket uh, as someone in the Western space, because it was sort of commissioned by federal dollars, um, you could really use it as something that said, here, this is your document. This is what your people said when they, <laughs> the people that you paid to do this. So here's how we're gonna help you meet those, those calls to action. Similarly, I think we now have 24 recommendations that the provincial government paid for. They paid for this process. They uh, relied on people to share incredibly personal stories, emotional stories, trauma stories of what they've gone through. And I think they now are really beholden to actually listen to the report uh, if, we can if we can keep the momentum going. From the UBC perspective, I think we have some challenges, but I feel optimistic that we have the leadership that are really um, going to walk this journey with us. Thank Cultural you. safety and humility training is huge. Uh, at the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health, after the Truth and Reconciliation, we implemented 20, UBC 2324, which is a cultural safety and humility experience for first year health professional students. Uh, and it's basically 2324, referring to calls to action 2324, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission's report. And, uh, and that's been going on now. We're entering, I believe, our fourth year. We've trained over a thousand uh, students completely, and there's another cohort going through. And essentially, it's basically looking at uh, elements of this so that you can't get a degree. Our ideal is you cannot get a degree in, health, in a healthcare profession in UBC without getting this baseline training. It's not okay. gonna, it's not gonna be perfect, but it's yeah. a start. And then we're aiming to do what we call the sandwich effect. We're gonna work to make it so that you can't be faculty in the health professions at UBC unless you have this training. And then we're gonna try to move it out to, you can't partner in research at UBC unless you have this training. And then working outside the walls of UBC with partners who hopefully will say, for example, the colleges uh, of the health professions, you can't get a license to practice medicine or dentistry or pharmacy or midwifery or social work or speech and audiology or whatever it is, uh, unless you have this training. It doesn't solve it, but it sets a, a very, 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 very low benchmark of this is what you have to start to learn. This is what you have to understand. And ideally, I hope, it would change those who are neutral to the side of realizing what they didn't know and really emphasize a desire to learn more. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Um, in the time we've got left, I'm going to give the word to Chelsea and to Karina, just if you can talk um, in terms of just responding to what James said about pandemic, Nadine, about some of those responses for training, but also Chelsea in your work that you do around that strength space and really demonstrating the power and strength within community for solutions and, and Karina too, in a little bit of that too. And then I think the time's gonna cut off from us, but um, I do wanna thank people and hand it over to you, Chelsea now. Um, yeah, thank you. So just very quickly, I think um, I used to talk about strength-based approaches. I don't talk about that so much anymore. I'm really interested in sovereignty and the exercising of, of Indigenous sovereignty as, as a means of our survival. And what we see in uh, with COVID and the Indigenous response here to COVID is when Indigenous nations could exercise their sovereignty, we saw our mob survive. Communities wanted to shut down before governments did. Our communities acted before government did. Because when we work in health, we actually are committed to the survival of the tribe. We are not wanting to alibi the state as though we're, we're destined to die out. And so we see the difference. So this is not just about having a voice or leadership. This is about the right for Indigenous peoples to exercise our sovereignty in the course of uh, health service provision, health through all aspects of it. And so I think that's the success story that needs to be told. We cannot silence sovereignty as, as, as though it's not integral to our survival as Indigenous peoples. It got us through the pandemic of COVID thus far, mm. but through the pandemic of colonialism and racism. And that's the ongoing fight that continues beyond this moment in time. That's all I'll say. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. It's um, the pivotal of everything. Karina. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think the health sovereignty approach is right in line with what we're thinking as well. Uh, certainly the work that we're doing um, in terms of COVID-19, what's been, we've been hit so hard. Um, I, I, we haven't been fortunate uh, in that way. Uh, we're, we're four times more likely to die from COVID-19 than any other group. And that's directly tied to the fact that 
COVID-19 literally exploits the structural racism and conditions that we are currently living in that already place us at high risk for health vulnerability. And then you couple that with already having high rates of co-occurring health conditions that have been driven by structural inequities that allow those conditions to take root and grow, right? And so we're dealing with situations where we don't just have diabetes that puts us at greater risk or just obesity, but quite often we have obesity and diabetes. And in the project that we have right now, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've got data back from about 14,000 for uh, American Indian Alaska Native people here in, in, the, in this country. And we're still an analyzing, so this is just very rough estimates, but you know, what we're dealing with is about 60% who are saying that they're dealing and living with uh, trauma-related stress disorder from COVID-19. And what that is, is it's incredibly high rates of loss at the community level. And as we know, in Indian country, when we lose somebody, it's not like being in a big urban center where you, you've lost a, a data point. <laughs> this is you know, losing uh, you know, four or five people in the community that you grew up with. And so it doesn't matter how close you are or not, they're still your community. And so that uh, impact has been pretty uh, devastating um, to some of our communities. Uh, but at the same time, communities enacted their sovereignty very quickly. We've been in pandemics before. We've survived pandemics. We've had to deal with this in the past. So we take it incredibly seriously. Um, and so communities shut blockaded, they put borders up and they enacted their sovereignty. And they had to go to battle with state governors because they, for example, wanted their truckers to come through the communities and communities said, nope, can't come through. <laughs> and uh, believe it or not, for once the federal government said, okay. So we actually had some support to enact, uh, enact it. But you know, even if we don't get that support, we still need to activate it and enact it. That doesn't matter, right? We have to continue to, to go forward. Um, the other issue is that really, uh, it's really exploited um, our mental health uh, vulnerability. So for those of us who are already a little bit uh, distressed and, and already have high levels of trauma exposure, this just was just an added layer. Now here's the good news, the really positive news, and I just wanna close with this, is that because we have a history and understanding of how to survive these. And we have our original teachings, our ancient instructions on how to live well and healthfully and how to recover. Uh, our communities have gotten very, very committed to more than ever, urban and rural and reservation to um, accessing traditional medicines to uh, mitigate the impact of COVID and also prevent COVID and coming into the homes and, and the households and also to recover from COVID. And people have been doing incredible knowledge sharing around what is working for them and communities have been there for each other. We've had more cultural activities, more language activities. People, because they wanna get outside of their homes and breathe fresh air, are activating their connection to the land in more helpful ways. So it, it, even though uh, this has been a, a negative impact on our communities, there are some blessings that are coming out of this that I, I think will have long-term impact that will continue to grow our health and well-being. Um, and finally, we focused on the one thing is knowing that we have to keep our uh, knowledge keepers and our elders protected. Um, they are our storehouses of knowledge and, and that information that gets passed on to the next generation. So communities immediately got around their elders and knowledge keepers to ensure that, that they would be safe. And, and so doing some of those kinds of things have been really empowering in our communities. Um, it's not to say there aren't some culturally stra strained uh, moments. So for example, doing funerary practices and customary rites, you know, that's been interrupted because of COVID-19. Um, and so that's been very stressful in communities, not being able to properly mourn and care for their ancestors initially, um, or people feeling like they can't say, please, let's not gather in the house. We need to go outside because we have to be, be protected. So, so communities are, are starting to work through that. And that's, I, I'm totally confident that uh, we're gonna come out at the end of this uh, stronger and healthier, uh, in part because we've had to come together and really trust our indigenous knowledges and our indigenous uh, health practices uh, under this time of stress. Thank you. I just want to thank everyone today. There have been a few questions come in. There's been comments there that have talked about how inspirational you've all been and how great it's been to listen to your points of view and, and the evidence that you all draw on and your work that you all draw on. Some of the questions, just to give an overview, are 
around the continuity of care and how people can ensure that continuity care when we're trying to deal with um, the concepts of close the gap as well. And that will send those on to people, the, the speakers. There's also a question there about how you turn any of this evidence, all of the evidence and the things you've spoken about into actually policy or practice. How do, how do people persuade policy makers or government bureaucrats or politicians to try and do that? And is that something that people can do or should do or just get on with the, the defining the bucket so, as such and working in community, as Chelsea said, and getting on to doing the work as both Nadine and James has said. Anyone want to put a few thoughts on that quickly before we, we finish up? James, how about you? Is that about translating? Uh, yeah, our... translating, yeah. Oh, I think you just have to keep on trying and trying and trying and put it in multimedia, uh, multi multiple mediums, um, get in there with politicians, get in there with policy makers, uh, use uh, the available tools we have, things like Crokey and, uh, and the Guardian and, uh, and all the conversation all types of uh, medium to get it out there. Work with communities, um, most importantly, to kind of say, this is what the research has found um, and how do, we, how do we reform or how do we, how do we implement this in, into practice? Thank you. All right, I'm gonna thank the speakers there. Thank you for being um, so engaging today. And I'm sure people, as they reflect on what's been said, um, we'll keep thinking more seriously and deeply about the words that you've shared and also the people that listen to the recording later that may not have been with us today. Um, but really big thank you to you. Thank you to UBC, um, University of British Columbia and UQ, the University of Queensland for hosting this first ever global series seminar. Um, it's been really great and it's great to see the commitment to have the first one up being around Indigenous health or Indigenous issues. And, mm -hmm and focused on that today. And it really sets a premise um, for our organisations going forward. And thank you to everybody that's tuned in today to listen to the webinar. Um, please look for the recording, but also look for the future webinars as they come um, to be advertised and become available. So thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. See you, Karina. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.